and Gracie Morehammer from the University of Bristol to tell us about rigorous computation of MOS forms, MOS forms of square free level. Right. Hello, everyone. And thanks to the organizers for uh, allowing me to give this talk. This is kind of a weird thing because this is one of the first conferences I've been in person as a PhD student. That should be a bit of an experience for me. And yeah, so today I'm talking about these rigorous computations of mass cusp forms of square free level. Uh, to start off with, I'm going to start with a definition of mass forms, which for people who do modular forms are very similar because a lot of the theory is very simple, uh, very same, but not I thought I'd go through it. But a lot of this is kind of not that necessary to know. So we start off with this let H be this uh, upper half plane, so complex numbers with imaginary part greater than zero. And we define this Hecker congruent subgroup gamma naught of n be the subgroup of SL2Z, where essentially this bottom left entry of the matrix is congruent to zero mod n. And this group acts on the upper half plane by these fractional linear transformations or fractional transformations, where by the action shown here. And on top of this, we have this modular surface, which is basically by this action, which is this finite volume non-compact surface with this Laplacian attached to the surface. And we also have this measure. This is just sort of things to say to help me define what a mass form is, but not really necessary to be remembered for this form. Okay. So what is a mass form? So a mass form is just a function from the upper half plane to the complex numbers of what I've got called level n and trivial character. So we're not going to do any characters in this form. If first it is an eigenfunction of this Laplacian. Uh, secondly, it's automorphic, so it's uh, invariant under this action. So here, uh, yeah, very similar to the modular form stuff, except there's no sort of weight with this. The tenth can be with weight zero mass form. Matter here. We also say it's square integrable, so it's in this L2 uh, space. And third, fourthly, it vanishes at the cusp. So very hand wavy. You can say with that, but it can be made more specific. But for us, it doesn't matter. And some definition here is that we would denote the space of mass cusp on the level n and the plus angle lambda by this s lambda of n. And all the, and we'll say that the cell function is satisfied the last three points to be this L2 cusp function. These are basically just definition to which will make it easier later on. But the important, the main important thing to really note is that it's the eigenfunction of the plus here, really. That's kind of plainly what we want. Okay. And here are some pretty pictures from the other FDB. So this one, the top left, is the first level one uh, the mass form. The one on the right, I think, is the first like even mass form, whatever that means. And then some level two is level three forms. I think which is kind of nice about these functions is that you can plot them very nicely. They are just complex sort of wave functions. So they have this sort of very nice pattern with them. Okay. Now some more definitions, annoyingly. So we have. This, so let's say we have some mass form with the plus eigenvalue lambda. Then we also have these heck operators, which I haven't defined here because I didn't want more equations. But essentially, similar to modular forms, they just map the space of mass forms to more mass forms. And on top of this, uh, mass forms also have a Fourier expansion. So, or uh, yeah, so it's with these a n, which is the Fourier coefficient times by square root of y, this k Bessel function, then the exponential function. <coughs> And it's not really need to know what the k Bessel function is, but it's there. And we also write this r, which is also the plus eigenvalue of lambda equals a quarter plus r squared. And I will kind of annoyingly swap between the two and call them both for the plus eigenvalue, but they can be, uh, they're related by this formula. They're pretty much the same. And suppose now uh, we have this f that's an eigenfunction of all the heck operators for Tn. So basically, this TNF is this lambda n of f. When it's, I should have probably showed a different symbol than lambda, but this lambda n basically is these Fourier coefficients, where for positive n, it's just the Fourier coefficient a n completely, and for negative n, it's plus or minus, providing if the sort of symmetry of the uh, Fourier coefficient. So the, if a n equals minus n, we call it an even form, and if a n equals minus a of n, it's the, an odd form. And we can also normalize for a of one equals one. So very similar stuff to modular forms. And basically from this and from a theory from heck operators, we can show that there exists an orthogonal basis F, uh, fj of this L2 cusp. So basically of all these functions that's my last three points, they're also eigenfunctional these heck operators. 
And so when I mean computing a mass form, what I actually mean is numerically finding this lambda and also finding some A of M. Now, unlike with modular forms, there's no storm bound, stone bound or anything like this, where we, or like all these numbers aren't like rational numbers. We don't really know what they look like. They're normally, we feel the best we're going to really get is numerical approximations to them. And yeah, what I mean by rigorous computation is that I'm planning on computing these lambdas and these A of Ns, up A of N up to N some limit with some rigorous error values on them, such that I have an interval for which they exist. In. Okay. Some history of the computation. So in, two, in the 1990s, a hedge was developed an algorithm that was generalized by a student Frederick Strom Bergson to work for congruent subgroups. And this is kind of the main algorithm that's used. The main negative of it is that it's a, it relies on a heuristic algorithm. So it works very well in practice when you try to implement this, it's very fast and works well. However, it, there's no actual rigorous proof to say that this converges to true mass forms as of yet. Uh, but in 2006, Booker, Strombergson, and Venkatesh first an algorithm to verify the computation afterwards. And this was originally done right for level one. However, recent work of Kieran Child has generalized this to general level and character. The, this sort of uh, algorithm, though, really is kind of good for verifying a few uh, mass forms, whereas you'll see with this algorithm, you can do sort of lots of the same, like, lots of the same time. Right, this one's very good for like getting really high precision uh, for some certain ones, but and I thought also say that 2006 book of strong books and think and oh, sorry, the book of strong books and use a subway trace formula for numerical quantity mass forms before, however, they were more concerned on proving non existence of mass forms in some intervals. Okay, so what is the Solberg trace formula? So, Solberg trace formula basically allows is a formula that allows you to consider all the mass forms at once. And for a fixed level n, and it was derived in the 1950s to prove the existence of mass cut forms. And essentially, suppose you have this f of j eigenbasis with some of the plus eigenvalues. You essentially can compute this left hand. You have this thing called the spectral side, the left hand side, which is the sum of all of them with some sort of nice test function. And this right hand side is some geometric side, which is known, which you can compute. It has lots of stuff which is very nice and known, very explicit. Is nice. So the left hand side we want to know about, we know nothing about the right hand side, we can put on a computer and compute. And here's a picture of what a test function kind of looks like. Uh, I think this is the exact one which I use for my computation, but it's kind of like kind of like a Gaussian, but it drops. Sorry, that's it. Okay. And for a quick aside for modular forms. So the idea of using the trace form for modular forms has been well known for a while, and people use this for uh, it's in the pre command MF, MF eigenbasis. And this works very well. We can just use linear algebra and heck operators to find a basis. And the case with mass forms, however, is that all my things are, all the things are infinite dimensional. So now we no longer have nice finite dimensional linear algebra. Everything becomes infinite dimensional. It's not very nice. But the kind of goal of what we're going to try and do is choose a test function such that basically it decays far enough such that all the little eigenvalues in the tail are negligible. We don't really care about them. And then we can kind of try and treat the problem with finite linear algebra one and remove all the contributions that are nearby. Okay, so I'll make this a bit more specific. So if we fix the level n and let fj be this heck eigenbasis again, and we have these plus eigenbase lambda j, and we're going to order them, but we have a thing, and then we let these a and j of n be the heck eigenvalues of each of these points, of each of these functions. And again, we fix some nice test function H that is positive and monotonically decreasing. And then the trace formula allows us to compute this quantity. Now, we can't compute the quantity exactly, we compute it through this geometric side, but essentially we can get a numerical answer that's completely rigorous for each of these values for any n. That's kind of the, the point. And we, we, we're going to be able to compute lots and lots of these values. That's sort of like the thing that we're able to do. Okay. And okay, so here's sort of the intuition of what it is. So we have this test function, and these sort of green lines are meant to be where all the plus eigenvalues are. Now we don't know this where this is in the case, but they're kind of there. And the goal of what we're going to do is there's an infinite number of them, but we can tell that the ones that are really far away, they're just the, the contribution of the trace form is going to be tiny. So we can worry about them. And we're going to try and do linear algebra to kind of knock out these points using its Fourier coefficients, some like orthogonality relations. 
and then get one eigen, and then try and kind of get one eigenvalue left, and then see how well this eigenvalue kind of removes the rest of the contribution of the trace formula. Okay, so yeah, so more details. So essentially, we're going to choose these CM. So we have the sequence of real numbers CM, such that basically they're going to be zero when we're not co prime. And they're also just going to, yeah, they're just going to be some sequence. And we have by this these Hecker relations, which is basically the relations of the Hecker operators. That this sum of CM AJ of M squared can be written as this single sum over the AJs. So this is the same heck relations that come with uh, modular forms, but the fluid mass forms. And I'm going to define this weird looking QC of H, which is essentially a quadratic form where essentially I'm looking kind of like the trace formula, but now I have this sort of sum of CM AJ M squared. And then what I do is I just apply the same formula that I did above and rewrite it. And this term on the right hand side on this uh, second line is just the trace formula value. So we get this TMD. And this bottom line is essentially just a quadratic, is a quadratic form where the CM1, the C are the vectors on either side. And this sum in the middle on the end is just this matrix of trace formula values. And the goal that we're going to do is choose these Cs such that it removes the contributions of all the mass forms that we don't want. So to make this, give a little bit of intuition as to what's happening, suppose that you have some numerical approximations to lambda j and base aj from some algorithm, say from Pedro's algorithm or whatever. And we want to try and choose these CIs such that essentially we have some form, which would be this uh, AI. And we'll choose these CIs such that for each of these for coefficients, it removes all the contribution of those except for the one form that we want. And then we then consider it for this, this other test function where we essentially just take lambda minus lambda i tilde. And we consider this uh, ratio, which initially looks a bit weird, but this, the thing that's happening with this Q is when we choose this, this CI such that one, this sum at the top will pretty much just give the contribution of the one eigenvalue that we want, plus error in the tail. But like I said, the error in the tail is basically negligible, so we don't have to worry about this. And we then do a ratio of that between how well it removes the contribution to everything. And this essentially gives you a weighted average of where the plus eigenvalue is. So we then get this error back at the bottom. So once we compute this at epsilon i, we can then show that there does exist a plus eigenvalue in this range. Okay. So what do we actually do in practice? So I've weirdly also chosen h tilde here, but trying to, it's a different h tilde to the one here. Uh, so we have this h tilde, which we don't do lambda h tilde. And essentially what we're going to do now is initially just actually compute the eigenvalues in the first place, non-rigorously. So we have these, these two test functions and we consider their quadratic forms. And then when we write it, we want to find these uh, eigenvalues lambda j, so which we can find by just finding the solutions to these, this generalized uh, symmetric eigenvalue problem, because this h tilde has this lambda h already. So this is where this problem comes about. And this is a nice, well-known way to solve this classical eigenvalue problem. So we can, we can solve this. And this will give us some numerical approximations to the lambda. And, but these are non-rigorous. These are just going to be some number that we assume. And what we'll then do is the eigenvectors that we then get, we will then use as our CIs. And the reason kind of for this is, which is this kind of quantity that we're going to be kind of computing is kind of like the Rayleigh quotient. So when you put an eigen, when you put it with this kind of, kind of, not quite with this, with normally Rayleigh quotients, if you put in the eigenvector of your eigenvalue, you get the eigenvalue out of this quotient or an error of it. Whereas here, we're not going to do it quite because we're going to be using all the different ones, but it should, in theory, give us what we want to remove the contribution of the rest, which it 
it does. And the reason why this is really good is we only have to then solve this equation once for each level. And normally when you solve this, you have to do two matrix diagonalizations, which is quite costly. So with this, you only have to do two per level, which is very nice, it saves a lot of time. So yeah, kind of basically what I said in practice, we have our, now we only need numerical approximations to our lambda tilde, which we get through this. So we don't need any other algorithm for this. We get to some approximation we compute through this. We then define this epsilon i similar to before with these ci's. And then again, we get an error bound on the lambdas. And that's essentially how the algorithm works to compute error bounds. On top of this, we can further prove that we didn't miss any. So essentially, if we go back a few slides to this test function, uh, once you have a bunch of approximations, we can use it to approximate one of the tests, one of the trace formula values, and then test the difference between our known value of the trace formula plus this like finite sum. And the error of that can kind of give us how far along we've completed the function to. So we can gain, uh, we can find out if we've missed any. And on top of this, we can also get rigorous error bounds in the Fourier coefficients, but it takes a bit too long to describe. So I thought I would just describe how to get rigorous error bounds on the, the plus eigenvalues. Okay. So some of the computational remarks. So this was all done in C in the R library. So this is integral ball arithmetic, basically. So you treat everything as a midpoint and a radius. And this allows, and this allows us to get rigorous error bounds on everything. And it's also pretty fast, even though it's still using software um, floating point, essentially, it's still in C. So you get a lot of speed. And currently, this method has only been implemented for square free level n. And that's mainly because of the fact of the ability of an explicit form of solvo trace form. That's sort of the, the main thing, but it should be able to be generalized for higher level. And using this method, we're able to compute 33,000 odd mass forms between square free level between 2 and 105. And the ranges of these epsilon i's about 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 2. So the, the range of which you get of the rigorous error bounds is, I guess, quite low precision. But in practice, they're actually, they're actually uh, computed to a lot higher precision. But in, we can only prove it to this amount of precision. So, yeah. And with this, because we also get rigorous error bounds on the Fourier coefficients, we're able to verify this Ramanujan piece of conjecture for 13,000 of the forms of prime up to less than 2,000. Which so the Ramanujan piecing conjecture for mass forms is still an open problem, and it basically says that these AP should the the Fourier coefficients of prime should be less than in value value less than two. So we're able to verify this, which for higher level forms because we get rigorous rigorous error bounds, and actually, although that we can do it for all the forms, but we don't have the error bounds are too big to actually prove it. I like in the actual numerical answers, there's they also are below two. These are the ones which you can rigorously prove. And then as a final remark, we also have made this plot, which is looking at all the A, AJP prime and the prime to the uh, Sarthe tape. So some of its modular forms, the mass forms are conjectured to follow this sort of same Sarthe tape measure. And the data shows a very good fit and kind of shows that maybe the algorithm is probably working. <laughs> so yeah, it's just kind of a nice picture. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you.